Um, welcome everybody to the Bats in Agriculture webinar with Alberta Community Bat Program and Alice. Um, we're so happy that you could join us today. There's been lots of interest in this webinar, so clearly everybody is as much a fan of sky puppies as I am. <laughs> um, it's really exciting to see and uh, we appreciate your time, um, especially so close to the holidays here. So um, just a couple housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, started. Um, we are going to record this seminar. We've had lots of interest in um, from people who couldn't attend in person today. So we are going to record it and we'll, uh, we will end up posting it online. So if you're not comfortable with um, maybe having your video or your name um, present, I would just encourage you to turn off your video and um, you can also adjust the name on your screen just by clicking the, little th the three little dots beside your name. Um, I will also ask, just because we do have so many people in this call, that you stay muted um, during the call unless you're actually speaking, asking a question, um, which we will um, defer most of the questions to the end of the session, um, just to make sure that we stay on time and uh, respectful of everybody's time today. Um, but that said, as questions pop up, we really encourage you to use the handy chat feature, which um, Assuming your screen looks the same as mine, it's kind of at the top um, top right of the screen. There's a little chat bubble looking thing. You can click on that and type in whatever you'd like. We'll monitor that, that chat. And um, if there's questions that kind of need immediate um, answers, then we'll try to interject and get those questions answered at the time. Otherwise, we'll hold them and ask them at the end. And lastly, before I hand it over to Susan Holroyd from the Alberta Community Bat Program to teach us everything that there is to know about bats in Alberta in, in a very short time of about an hour, um, I would just like to uh, recognize that we're um, coming here to you from many, many different places, likely around Alberta and perhaps even beyond. For me, I come from Calgary, um, which is the traditional territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy. It's home to the Siksika, the Kainai, the Pikani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Re Nation uh, Region 3. Um, and so we're really thankful to be on this land in the home of all Treaty 7 people in the region of Southern Alberta. So um, gratitude there, first and foremost. And of of course, we also share that home with many species of bats, which Susan is going to tell us about. So without further ado, um, I, I guess I didn't introduce myself either. I, I should have probably started there. My name is Christine Campbell, and I'm the Senior Western Hub Manager with Alice Canada. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about what Alice is after Susan's session. So Susan Hallroyd, I pass it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, um, before I throw up my slides, I'll... Yeah, just a little bit about myself. Um, I work with the Alberta Community Bat Program, um, but I've worked with bats for the past, it's almost been three decades. It's really aging myself. But I came out uh, to study bats at the University of Calgary as uh, doing my graduate work with Robert Barkley in the early 1990s. Um, I come from originally from Ontario, though, and I grew up uh, on an apple orchard. So I am familiar with the, the farming lifestyle. And um, Yes, I've worked. Uh, I've worked in industry. I, I've worked with a consulting company downtown Calgary when I first graduated. I worked with uh, the Ministry of Environment in BC. So I was a government employee, and now I work with a nonprofit. So I've got uh, lots of things behind me, and I've worked extensively with British Columbia and Alberta, uh, creating best practices for bats specifically for the past. It's been almost twenty years working on best management practices for different resource sectors. So the one we did actually finish recently with British Columbia and Alberta has been the best practices for agriculture. And I'll talk a little bit about that too. So that's a resource that will be available on our website as well. So I'm gonna share my screen now and I'll give you, not just to look at me, but some nice pictures of bats. Um, where we go oh, from the beginning. All right, let's hide that thing. And I like the laser pointer option. There we go. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, so th there's a nice hoary bat on the front, not your typical bat, very pretty one. Uh, but yes, we're going to talk about bats today. And yes, they're the nighttime insect controllers, and they are really quite important, not only to agriculture, but forestry and, uh, and for people in general, because they do eat a lot of nighttime uh, insects that include biting things like mosquitoes, but that's not all they eat. So today, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, give you a little bit of background on the the program itself, what our objectives are, what are the, the current things we're up to, why we're actually concerned about bats, some of the threats to bats, uh, the, the bat friendly farming initiative, I'll talk about that and the economic importance of bats. I'll give you a quick lowdown on species and ecology of bats in Alberta. I'll talk a little bit about building bat houses. And then I have a few little pointers about bats and rabies and what to do if you found a bat. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm gonna to try to cover today. So I may fly through a few things because I, I probably have too many slides, but um, let's move right along. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end. So the community bat program was put together in 2016. Uh, Alberta Environment actually initiated the program because they wanted some group to take over looking after bats and trying to get an, a, a, an assessment of bat population numbers. And Alberta Environment hasn't been tracking bat populations. Uh, and so one of the things that we have is our uh, a citizen science project, and that's what they wanted us to take over. But Alberta Environment didn't want to keep us, so they have actually uh, passed us over to Wildlife Conservation Society Canada or WCS Canada, which is a national nonprofit organization. And they're our mothership. So we're a program of WCS Canada. So our objectives for the program are not only the citizen science project, but also uh, to do this kind of outreach and raise awareness about bats and um, try to support bat conservation in Alberta. So we do outreach events and we go to schools and give talks and we have our online presence. Uh, we promote our public stewardship through the Citizen Science Project and we help people who have bats in buildings, give them advice. We don't actually help ex with, do exclusions. There's uh, professionals who do that and we help people with advising them what to do if they found a bat. We have resources on our website that are free uh, for download. And we also have been involved in some monitoring programs recently. We've kind of ramped up on that. And we've got a few research projects that we've actually started. So we're quite active on social media. And I always bring this up because uh, this is actually uh, something that's really important nowadays when you're applying for grants. Uh, they, When you're filling out your grant applications, they ask you about your social media following and the levels of engagement and what kind of reach you have. So the more people you have following you, the greater your reach and the greater your engagement if you can get people to engage with your posts. So if it's a little thing you can do, but if you're on social media, feel free to follow us. If you just Google at Alberta Bats or, or look us up at Alberta Bats, you should be able to find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we also have a YouTube channel, which is still quite new, but we have some pretty cool video up there too, if you wanna look for some more um, video on bats. So some of the resources that we have are on our website. Again, if you just Google Alberta Bats, we're at albertabats.ca. And you look under the resources tab, you can find there's these three main um, guidebooks that we have available. This one's for managing bats and buildings. Uh, we have another one that talks about how to install bat houses. And we have free bat house plans on the, uh, that are included with this, uh, with this guidebook. And we have this guidebook which is uh, our most recent large one. Um, it's called Building Bat-Friendly Communities. And it has background information on the bat species in Alberta, uh, distribution maps, talks about the hazards for bats, what you can do in your backyard to make your backyard more friendly. Uh, so there's a brief list of some of the types of native plants you could plant to improve habitat for bats, um, and just some really good background information. And we're soon going to be releasing um, the best practices brochure for bat friendly farming. It's a four page brochure and uh, we're just working on the, the graphics for that. But uh, the material is basically put together and that should be up on our website soon. Uh, our most recent released guidebooks are one that was targeted to pest control operators 
And again, that's about managing bats in buildings. And the biggest thing about excluding bats to do it in a bat friendly way is to mind the timing windows. So you don't wanna be doing exclusions for bats in the middle of summer when colonies are present and there's baby bats present because they're flightless. You can, if you exclude the mothers, then you just leave the babies inside and they can die. And so there's, there's, there's certain timing windows for bats uh, to make it a bat friendly exclusion. And then we have this fun one, uh, the coloring and activity book. We actually ended up uh, getting a graphic artist from Edmonton, a uh, young guy, and he did most of the, he did all the illustrations in the book. And we have lots of little activity things to do as well. And so it's, it's a free download that's on our website as well. So the citizen science project that I was telling you about, uh, it involves having citizens report their roost if they have a bat roost in a bat house or in a building and all they have to do is count how many bats they have in their roost and there's a specific protocol on how to do that and you we ideally you do it a couple of times early in the season and a couple of times later on in the season that gives you an idea of how many pups have fledged if they've started flying and you submit a guano sample so a bat poop sample and we can send it away and they can get species from feces so the, this map here shows the reporting that we've got so far from Alberta. And you can see it's pretty heavily focused towards the, the cities of Edmonton, Red Deer and Calgary. Uh, Waterton Biosphere Reserve got on board this past year in, or two years. And they have recruited a bunch of people who have reported some roosts as well. We would like to get more uh, reports from these places where there are no little dots. Um, most of the re reports from the feces, it showed up uh, that most of them are little brown bats. So over 75% of the reporting is little browns that are in bat houses and buildings. And uh, the rest are mainly big brown bats. We have like, one occurrence or two occurrences of silver haired bats in, in uh, roosts. And the white dots that you see on the map are people who didn't send us any poop. So we need poop samples for sure because there's actually... A couple of other species, the long-legged and long-eared myotis, that could be using buildings, um, but, but we just haven't got reports, but I think we just need to increase our sample size. So, but we have had some pretty good data for the past four or five years, and it's giving us a good baseline to give us an index, at least, of, of populations for those species. So the anticipated outcome of, of all that data is that we'll be able to contribute to the North American Bat Monitoring Program, which is a uh, program set up between the US uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, USDA, and uh, the Canadian biologists. So it's a North American program that is actually more of an acoustic monitoring program, but they're also taking roost counts. We'll uh, have hopefully better management recommendations for uh, buildings better in habitat enhancement guidelines for bat houses because we're actually monitoring some of those bat houses with uh, temperature sensors and, and getting uh, profiles of temperatures within bat houses and, and figuring out what's the ideal design for a bat house. And um, it also will give us potential sites for treating bats that are exposed to white nose syndrome. There's a fungus that causes a disease called white nose syndrome in bats and it's has been devastating white nose or North American bat populations. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about white nose later on. Um, but our WCS Canada biologist, who's a, a, a bat biologist in, in British Columbia, has been working with Thompson River University and a couple other people. And um, we've been developing a probiotic, which is, uh, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. But there's a potential that we could treat bats and help them improve their survival uh, rates if they've been exposed to white nose syndrome. So that's kind of exciting and it, and it shows quite, quite a bit of promise as well. So bats, we'll just talk a little bit about bats in general. Um, they belong to their own order called Chiroptera, which literally means hand wing. Chiro means hand and Terra means wing. And you can see this is a bat wing. Not too many people get up close to bats, so you don't get a good look at them, but it's basically like your hand. So this is their wrist. This is their thumb sticking up the top and they use that for climbing. So they really need their thumbs. 
And then they have these long slender fingers, finger bones, and you can see the little knuckles on the fingers. And then in between each finger is the wing membrane. And this would be the pinky finger. And then from the pinky finger that goes all the way down to their ankle and that creates the wing surface. Uh, you can tell adults from juveniles, if you look at their little knuckles, the uh, degree of ossification will tell you whether you're dealing with a juvenile or an adult, but after their first year, that little knuckle gets all round and bony and solid, and then you can't really age bats that way. So the only way we can get ages of bats is through banding, and they put a little a split ring band over top of their forearm right around here. So there, I think there's some pictures of bats with bands. You watch some of the slides. So in, in Alberta, a lot of people think we have the bat, uh, but we actually have nine different species of bats, quite diverse. And if you look across Canada, uh, we have 18 confirmed species. British Columbia has uh, acoustic recordings for a couple of other species. So that might be more like 20 for Canada. Uh, so British Columbia itself is, is quite diverse because they have that dry interior habitat that it's almost like a desert and they have 15 species so compared to our nine they're quite diverse but if you look around the world the only place that doesn't have bats are places that are have no trees basically uh, but we have over 1400 species of bats on the planet the last count i looked up was 1439 and that number keeps going up as people go to the tropics and they find new species and uh, do DNA and the taxonomists are always finding new species. So you have to keep checking that number, but it keeps going up. Um, but it, they're a very diverse group. They represent the second largest group of mammals on the planet. The only group that has more mammals species in it are the rodents. So one and one quarter of all mammals on the planet are bats. So they're, they're widely distributed, very diverse, and they're quite important to many of our ecosystems. Now, when you're looking at bats, this is a, just a, a fun picture that shows some of the bat diversity that we have around the planet. Um, you look at ears, ear shape and ear size varies hugely across species. Um, noses change significantly. All of our bats have what they call plain nose bats. But if you look over in Europe and Africa and South Asia, you'll find the bats, they have these leaf nose bats. Uh, and the leaf apparatus is basically, it's used for projecting sound. So our bats, when they echolocate, they yell through their mouth, uh, but these leaf nose bats, they project the sound out through their noses, which is kind of cool. Um, they all have these little pieces in their ears called a tragus and uh, the eye shape and sizes change as well. Uh, this is a, of course a flying fox uh, and they're a totally different group of bats from what we have. And flying foxes are tend to be fruit eating bats and some of them are nectar feeding bats. Uh, they don't echolocate and they use these big eyes to see where they're going. So they have to have twilight or bright moonlight to fly. They can't fly around in the pitch dark, not like our bats. All these are insect eating bats up here uh, and they fly around in the dark. And this is actually a bat we have in Canada. This is a spotted bat. It is proportionally the largest ears of any bat species compared to its body length. If you, if you put your arms up over your head, uh, that, and that would be how big your ears would be compared to your body size, uh, how high you can reach. That would be how big your ears would be. Compared, that would be like a spotted bat. They have huge ears. And then this guy is a little uh, African bat. It's a, called a crested freetail bat, and they're not sure what the crest is for. They think it's for impressing girls. Um, this is another insect insectivorous bat that was recently found in the South Sudan. We have frog eating bats. Uh, this guy, he's got his mouth full. This is a foot of a fish eating bat. There's bats that drag their feet through the water and catch fish. Um, and then of course the vampires. And out of the 1,439 species, we have three small species. They're tiny guys like our, our, the size of our insect eating bats um, that feed entirely on blood. Of those three species, two of them feed on birds and only one of them feeds on mammals. And we always get, when I do school talks, we always have to talk about vampire bats because everybody wants to learn about vampire bats. And they're really, if, you, if you'd like to go on a tangent and read about bats, vampire bats are fascinating socially. So they're a really interesting group. 
So they are a conservation concern, but uh, why? Well, you have to look at bat reproductive rates and understand their life history to figure out why we're so concerned about bats. Now, a lot of languages, bats are considered, or they think of, think of bats as mice. Um, in German, they're called a the Fledermausen, which means a flying mouse. And in French, you call them the chauve souris, which is uh, a, sh a shaved mouse or a hairless mouse. And mice tend to, or small mammals, small rodents like this, they tend to only live two or three years. They have large litter sizes, lots of babies, and they might have two or three litters in a summer. And bats, on the ha other hand, only have one pup per season. In their first winter, the first year, half the pups don't make it through the first winter, um, but they live a very long time. We have bats that in the, in the literature have lived up to 42 years. So it means we have a really slow recovery of populations. So we're actually, bats are a lot more like a grizzly bear. So grizzly bears tend to live a long time. They have small litter sizes. Um, they don't have a high rate of recruitment. Um, and they, again, they too have a slow recovery of populations. So it's interesting. So I, I always tell people that if there's one thing to go home with is to think of bats not as little flying mice, but as little flying grizzly bears, because that's what they're more like. And that's, that's primarily why bats globally share this and why bats globally are a conservation concern. So why, why do we even care? Well, for the insect eating species, they're, they're a huge predator of nocturnal insects. They eat a ton of bugs. Um, and they're a really important part of many ecosystems. In some parts of the planet, uh, we're dependent on them for pollination. So things like bananas and durian and mangoes and, and, and all sorts of tropical fruit. So uh, many of them, the wild versions of these fruits are pollinated by bats. Um, so they're quite important in that way. And some of the fruit eating bats are actually really key in dispersing seeds as well as they'll, they'll consume the, the um, consume fruit and then they fly away from the fruit bearing tree and they poop everywhere. So that's really helpful because they disperse the seeds and then the seeds germinate across the landscape and you get reforestation. So in, in, um, in some countries, they call them the night gardeners because they're so important in um, seed dispersal. And they're worth a lot of money to our North American economy, uh, the insect eating bats in just the number of bugs that they, they eat. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as part of the Bat Farm Friendly Farming Initiative. So this past year, we had a grant with um, the Calgary Foundation and some of the objectives of that Bat Friendly Farming Initiative was to create a brochure with the best management practices for farms, uh, which we have accomplished, but is yet to go up on our website. That's soon to come up. We, we had a survey of uh, farmers and the farming community to understand just how people th thought about bats. Like, do they look at them as uh, an ally or do they look at it as a pest um, or do they think about bats at all? So we really just wanted to understand whether the farming community even thought about bats or if they wanted to learn more about bats. Um, and the results of that survey, I ended up actually with about a hundred or so uh, responses over the survey period, which was pretty good. It was a fairly you know, intense survey um, in that it, was, it took about 20 minutes to fill out. And I found, I, I, I kind of think we might've been biased though because we only recruited people online. So I think I might've got a lot of people who actually initially really do, they like bats and that's why they participated because everybody seemed to like bats. And, uh, but maybe it's because there's the understanding that they do eat a lot of insects and they are a value. And so they are, they are a component that you can add as part of your integrated pest management strategy for your farm. Um, so many people wanted more information about bats, um, especially about bat houses and um, just what they can do to improve their habitat for bats. Um, the other component of the Bat Friendly Farming Initiative was we collected poop, bat poop, on uh, at roosts on farms or near farms, and we're going to be sending that those guano samples away. Uh, they can actually do some pretty detailed diet studies now, um, looking at bat guano 
uh, not only can you get the bat species from the DNA in the bat guano, but you can also dig down and get the insect DNA. And then they can actually compare the, what you get out of the bat guano to a library of barcodes of different insect species. And they can actually generate a list of the kinds of insects down to species that bats are consuming. So we're hoping we'll be able to generate some kind of report at some point. Uh, just to get a better idea of the, exactly what bats are eating out there, because we know they'll eat lots of different kinds of insects, but we're not exactly sure what species. And some of them may be the targeted um, pest species that uh, that agriculture has been looked at, looking at for a long time. So the other the other thing that we were we were interested in it was bats and cows, and um, we initiated a study with the University of Calgary, the veterinary medicine faculty. Um, we had a fourth year or second year vet med student who had bat detectors out at W ranches this past summer. And the idea was to look to see if we had more activity in pastures with cattle versus pastures without cattle, because there's some indication from other places that uh, bats like to hang around cows. And it might make sense because cows ha usually have a lot of flies hanging around them. So uh, they actually are like a little mobile patch of food. So we, we wanted to get a handle on that to see if that was happening here. Um, and we're still analyzing that data. So that'll be interesting when we figure that out too. So the actual value, well, there has been a couple of studies. Uh, there's this, this study by Boyles et al from 2011. Um, they looked at, I believe they've kind of focused on the Southern states like Texas and area. And they looked at, I think, they were looking more at just corn and cotton crops, but they generated an estimate of the value of bats to agriculture. And it ranged from 3.7 to $53 billion a year. Um, so that was because bats are consuming so many pest insects and they consume especially moths and beetles and bats will eat their own weight in insects in a night. And in some places in Southern Texas, you have these Mexican free tail colonies that are, there's 20 million bats in some of these colonies. Um, so when you start figuring out how many, it's how many insects they're eating, it's literally tons of insects each night that they're consuming. So they didn't look, this, this value averaged out to about 23 billion a year. They didn't look at the value of uh, bats to forestry because obviously there's beetles and moths that affect forestry. So if there was bats eating those, that would be a value. And they didn't look at the cost of pesticides um, that you would have to lay out if you didn't have bats eating those insects. So like there could be additional costs for chemical control if you didn't have this free ecosystem service that the bats are providing. Um, and there's evidence of this value to agriculture from studies around the world. Uh, in the UK, there's been research on bats and farms. Uh, they found a similar thing. Uh, in, in Europe, there's been several studies. Uh, it's, and in, um, in India, there, there has been some work. So they've looked at basically um, olive, olive orchards and rice paddies and um, some kinds of nut crops, in, or like forests uh, or orchards where they believe that the, the research shows that bats were having a significant impact on the pest insect levels in those systems. So there, I mean, it, we haven't got any specific research that's been done in Alberta uh, or even really, there's been a couple of projects in Canada that's been, has dealt with bats in agriculture, but there's, it's really, there's been very little work that's been done in Canada but there is lots of evidence from around the world. So how is this possible? Well, like I said, the bats are eating moths and they're eating and moths lay eggs that, and then you get the caterpillars that infest uh, crops, have significant damage. You've got beetles and, and the beetle larvae that are being laid. Uh, and these beetles can be big consumers of crops. And the biting flies are a big issue for cattle. So. Uh, when they're consuming all of these different types of insects, it can be really important for agriculture if you've got uh, this little nighttime predator out there uh, eating that many bugs. And like I said, they can eat their own weight in insects at night, especially reproductive females. So those 
those bat houses that you put up and you get a colony, that's uh, those that's a group of reproductive females, uh, females with young. And because they have the added energy demand of nursing a pup, they're eating tons of insects every night. Um, and you, one of the other things is that you you have lots of bats and different different bat species eating different sized insects and different types of insects. So you want to have a diverse community of bats because then they have a diverse diet. So they might be uh, targeting the insect that you want to get rid of. Um, the other way that bats can actually have a significant impact on pests, insects, especially moths, um, is through this thing called the soundscape of fear, which I love this term. Um, some of these moths actually can hear bat echolocation calls. It's the only thing that they have like a little neuron that's tuned into the echolocation frequency um, of some bats. And whenever a bat comes up behind it and starts calling, it initiates a, a, a flea response and one wing will stop working and then the moth will circle and fly to the ground to try to evade getting eaten by the bat. So when a bat's actually just flying over a crop field, echolocating and searching for insects, uh, they can affect these moths and cause the moths to fly away from the crop field or it, it prevents them from laying eggs. Laying eggs. And um, th there was actually a research that was done, a study that was done in the US and they did an exclusion type thing where they excluded um, bats from an area and they found a significant effect with um, these bats where bats were flying or bats were not flying. And, and there was definitely an, a significant effect just from having bats present in an area. So that's kind of cool. So they basically scare the snot out of a bunch of moths and then they don't lay eggs. So got to have bats around. So the three primary things that we recommend as far as uh, being a bat friendly farm is to focus on these three things, connectivity, diversification, and the retention of habitat features. Now, connectivity is really when you, you think about um, those, those windbreaks and hedgerows, there's a few species that don't like to cross big open spaces um, and they like to just fly along these edges. Uh, and along these edges is often when you have a little bit of a wind, the insects will also blow to those edges and they'll accumulate. So you'll get like little clouds of insects along the, the hedgerows. And this is where the bats will fly. So you want to keep connectivity between, uh, say, an area where you've got a, a clump of trees, where there's old trees where bats might be roosting, and maybe a water source. Um, if you keep the, the hedgerows in place or the windbreaks in place, they can move across the landscape and make it to all those different habitat types. So that gives you more functional habitat if you're a bat, if you can make it to these different parts of the, of the landscape because you've got the connectivity elements. So that's really important. Diversification is important. Um, and that's not only just diversification of like having chunks of uh, habitat on your farm that are left wild and where you have some native plants and old trees, which is what we want you to do is retain those features on your landscape, um, but also diversifying crops. So if you have uh, just a, one large monoculture, that isn't as good as if you have more than one um, type of crop in an area. And there was actually some research that was done in uh, Ontario, and they were looking at one kilometer squared areas. Um, and they found that in areas where you had more diversification of these one square kilometer areas, um, so one square kilometer of one crop versus the ne next door neighbor one was another square kilometer of a different habitat versus having it all in one type of crop. Um, they found a higher diversity of the number of it bats species and, uh, and, and more bats. There was, there was more, more bats around too. So, so you can diversify your crops on uh, the landscape as well. It can also help uh, diversify and support bats because you get different insects coming out at different times. Um, but the, the, the retention of habitat features, especially the old trees, wetlands and ponds, native vegetation, because then you're supporting some of the native insects. If you want to think about it this way, is it 
if you have a crop, you might have a, a, a single type of insect that hatches out at a certain time of year that you want the bats to eat. But on the times when your, your crop has not got any insects on it, or it doesn't have that pulse of insects, um, you need something else producing insects that might not have anything to do with your farm, but are food for bats. So you have to diversify so you have insects available through the entire summer. Um, and of course, reduction of pesticide use is important. Organic farms uh, definitely have higher rates of um, the higher diversity of bats and more bats around them. And like I said, water features are really important. And when you're thinking about a pond, um, the Bat Conservation International has had this recommendation in place for a long time is, is especially if you have um, troughs, water troughs, because some of the little bats will try to drink out of them and they can fall in. And so if you have a pond that they can't get out of, like they should be able to get out of this one from the sides. But what they've done here is they've put a couple of this log in and anything that falls in can just climb out the log. Because sometimes they will, they drink on the fly. So they'll come flying in and they'll swoop down and they'll take a sip from the surface of the water. Um, but they can trip, they don't, I don't know why, but sometimes they do and they end up in the pond. So then they can just climb out. So think about um, where you have water features if, if something fell in there, if it could get out again. And we've actually had bats that have fallen into rain barrels and couldn't escape as well. So uh, it does happen. So it's one of those things that you, it's an easy fix and it doesn't even have to cost anything. Just throw a log in there. So a little bit about our Alberta bats. <clears throat> like I said, we have nine different species. Um, three of them are migratory bats. And this isn't even like, I always show this picture and I always think that people must go, what, those are bats? Um, but yes, they live in Alberta. Uh, we have, this one is fairly rare. It's called a red bat and they are red. This is our biggest species in Canada, the hoary bat. It's nicknamed the sky lion because it has this yellow ruff around its face. And then we have these silver haired bats that are usually quite dark in color. Um, and that but they have this really um, distinctive frosted tips along their back. So these, these three are usually very easy to identify if you see them. The hoary and the red bats are long distance migrators. We're actually not sure how far south they go. Probably a couple thousand kilometers, southern USA, maybe Mexico. Um, some of the populations may fly like to California and go to the coast and overwinter there, but we're not sure. Uh, generally, we think they're active year round, but we don't know a lot about what they do once they leave. We actually don't know about that much of them about that much about them while they're here. They're very difficult to study. They're solitary bats. Uh, they roost high up in the foliage off of little twigs, and um, they're widely dispersed across the landscape. And they fly really high. So and they're doing it all in the dark. So it's really hard to figure out what's going on with these guys. The silver-haired bat. It only uh, roosts, it roosts in tree cavities. It only uses trees usually. Like I said, we had a couple of them in buildings and I think they just accidentally end up in buildings. I wouldn't expect to see a maternity colony in a bat house of this, this species. Um, so they, they're they really important for retaining. Um, if you retain those large trees, that's what they're gonna use. They're considered sensitive in Alberta, um, but these three species are uh, soon going to probably be listed federally as endangered. Um, all three of them are at risk from high mortality at wind farms. So we're, we're trying to get a handle on that. There's some modeling from hoary bats um, and the, the, there's been a team of biologists that have been reviewing these three species and evaluating its status recently. So in the next, I'd say year or two, um, they'll all be listed as well because we're worried about their populations. The other six species of resident bats are ones that stay here year round. Um, they hibernate and so they should be all sleeping now. So we have a big brown bat, uh, Aptescus fuscus, and then five myota species. So we have little brown, northern, western, small footed, long legged and long eared. This is a long eared bat. So you can see relatively, they have quite long ears. Um, myotis itself, these guys used to all be called bats but they changed them to the word myotis. Uh, to reflect the genus that they belong to. This is Myotis lucificus, uh, Myotis septentrionalis, and so and so on. And Myotis just means mouse-eared. So they all, there's the other five species all belong to the same genus, Myotis. So big brown bats are secure now. And um, there's been a recent update with the 
Wildlife Act. Uh, it has to be, it's not official, but it's, it's in the works. Um, this species was actually fairly unprotected up until just recently, but now it's listed on the licensed wildlife list. So it has enjoys the protection of wildlife like all the other wildlife in the province. Uh, and this is your fellow that you'd be looking to eat larger moths and beetles. These guys love to eat beetles. So uh, I think this is probably your workhorse on the farm. This is probably the one that's eating a lot of the bugs because they, they fly in open spaces, um, about tree height or a little lower, and they're, they're out all night flying and they can fly up to 25 kilometers from the roost. So they cover a big area. Uh, they do roost in buildings and they can form fairly large size colonies, 100 bats or more, but they also will roost in rocks and trees. So it gives them some flexibility. Um, so it's a, they're fairly hardy bats um, and they do winter over, uh, over, over winter in Alberta. The other species that would be common on uh, farms and you might find in buildings or in bat houses, um, is specifically is little brown myotis. Little browns are listed as endangered in Canada, and with the status update, they are now listed as endangered in Alberta. Uh, the other bat that might li live in a colony in a building or a bat house would be this long-legged myotis. Uh, status is undetermined. We, th these guys are not as common, um, and we don't catch them that often. Nobody's studied them very much in the province or actually anywhere in Canada or there's only been a few studies in the States. Um, he's a little bit of a mystery. We really don't know that much about uh, long-legged myotis. Um, but they behave very similar to little browns. Uh, again, a big moth eater. And then we have northern myotis, uh, which is one of the long-eared species. And this one is, as well, is listed as endangered in Canada and was recently listed as endangered in Alberta. Uh, this species is more of a northern uh, distribution. The um, long, there's another long-eared myotis and he tends to live in the southern part of the province. This one is associated with the boreal. Um, and he only, this one only likes to use trees. So it's, it, it was a, a species of concern before because it is dependent on old growth forest, um, but now it's listed as endangered. And that's the endangered listing for both this one and the little browns is because of white nose syndrome. So this is the other long-eared bat. You can see he's also got these quite long ears um, and he's more of a Southern Alberta species. Uh, he's quite hardy. Um, they live in rock crevices and in trees. Uh, so a little more flexible with their roosting style. And I think they might eat grasshoppers, but this is something that I, I would like to do uh, is, is to catch some bats down around Lathbridge during an, a grasshopper outbreak and uh, collect some poop and send it off for analysis because we have we suspect this guy might eat grasshoppers, but we're not sure. So he's pretty he's pretty um, helpful little bat, and fairly common actually. Uh, the other species we have is the western small footed. This guy is only about four grams. He weighs about the same amount as a quarter. Is so listed as a sensitive species in Alberta. They're totally cute little blonde bats with little black ears and black face, black wings. Um, and they only roost in rock crevices and they're distributed right along the river valley. So um, the South Saskatchewan, the Milk River and the Red River um, and probably the Red Deer River and um, maybe some of the adjacent tributaries off of these, um, these main rivers. You might get a little bit of habitat where you'd find these guys, um, but they're teeny tiny little bats and you catch them in a, a mist net, they go bzz, bzz, bzz. So they're kind of little buzzy bats. So this is the kind of habitat where you'd find uh, the little western small footed. So this is dry island buffalo jump, and they like to roost in the in the banks of the rivers. That's what they're roosting in, and some of the big browns roost in that kind of habitat as well. So if you look, if you looked up close, most of you probably have. Um, on the river banks, you get those erosion crevices, and there'll be these little holes. Some of these little gaps in these in these um, river banks can go back a meter, and they can get quite deep as well. So not only do they provide summer roosting habitat and a good place to raise their pups, um, if they're deep enough and they go below the frost line, um, they can overwinter there too. And there has been a little bit of research on um, this species and big browns, and they found them hibernating in these uh, 
these erosion crevices in the along the river valleys. So that's kind of cool too. So how do we study bats? Well, one of the big things we take advantage of is the fact that bats are really, really loud. Um, you wouldn't think they're loud because nobody hears them, but it's because they're using high frequency calls, 20 to 40 kilohertz. And humans can only really hear up to about 18 kilohertz. So we can't hear them when they're echolocating, uh, but they're flying around at night in, in the summertime, uh, yelling at the top of their lungs. 120 decibels is louder than a lawnmower. It's like having a smoke detector going off uh, 10 centimeters away from your ear. It's, they're, they're really, really loud. Um, interestingly, dogs and cats can hear them. They have a hearing uh, range in this range. And I, I believe cows can hear them as well. Cows and horses can hear them, um, but we cannot hear them. But we can hear them if we use a bat detector. So we have special gizmos um, that range in price. Uh, these ones you can set out. We have bat detectors that you can set out and attach them to poles or trees. And they have these uh, um, high tech microphones attached to them so they can sense ultrasonic calls. And we set them to, they program them to just record at night and whenever a bat passes. And, um, and then we can download the data and analyze them. And to some extent, you can tell out most of the species because some of the species have echolocation calls specific to them. Um, but there's some overlap and there's some difficulties. It's not completely um, straightforward, but it does provide some really good information about bat activity. Um, and then we have these little echometer touch units that you can plug into your phone or your tablet. Um, this one's a little more affordable. Uh, they're about $170 through Wildlife Acoustics, and you can turn your phone or your tablet into a bat detector. This unit is basically the um, high-tech ultrasonic microphone that can detect the bat echolocation calls. Um, and then it has free software you download that can basically, it, it discriminates which species is flying by. Uh, so you get a, a, a visual output. You can see the echolocation call. You can hear it with your own ears. And then it does this auto ID where it tells you what species has just flown by. Um, sometimes the identification isn't correct because like I said, there's there's some difficulty in discriminating between species, but it it's a, it's a, usually a pretty good guess. So what do bats sound like and what does that output look like? Well, this is kind of the output you get from one of these detectors. Um, these are echolocation calls. So they if you could hear them, it sounds a bit like a bird chirp where you have a swooping call that goes from a high frequency to a low frequency. And this is uh, represents a search phase. So a bat's flying around and it kind of correlates with their wing beat. So on the downstroke of the wing beat, they, they yell. So this is like a call, 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 call. And then at the end, here is what we call a feeding buzz. And when they see an insect in front of them, they won't put as much energy into each call, but they'll make a bunch of different little calls all really quickly. So they can get more information about which direction the bat, the bug is flying, uh, so they can catch it. Um, they can tell. It, it's it's highly sophistica sophisticated, sophisticated uh, 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 superpower that they basically have. They can tell the size of an insect. They can tell the texture of an insect, and they can tell which direction it's flying, how fast it's flying. It's pretty amazing. Now, if you listen close, every turn up the sound on their on your um, computers, uh, the next slide will show the same picture, but you should be able to hear this echolocation call series and listen for this feeding buzz at the end. That's the bat attacking an insect. So, so that's kind of cool, right? It's, I mean, I don't know if that's exactly what your cat or your dog hears, but there's, they're hearing something like that going on at night in the summertime. So as I always tell people, it's like, if you're walking around with your dog at night and, and he's staring up at the sky, it's like, he's not gone crazy. He's probably, he can hear a bat flying over your head that you can't see. So some of the threats to bats, um, there's a bunch. And like I said, if you look at our uh, Bat Friendly Communities Guidebook, uh, there's a good summary that covers all of this information. So if you wanted to go back and look and and then do an evaluation of your property to see if you've got some of these hazards, um, things like sticky fly paper. This is bad for birds as well. Uh, and I don't know how prevalent that 
it happens here, but I have heard from the wildlife rehab people that they do get birds and bats stuck on fly paper. So sticky fly paper, obviously if you get the insects stuck on there buzzing, you sometimes they'll get bats, they'll come up and try to attack the bugs and they get stuck on the fly paper and it's a terrible way for an animal to die. And, and I'm not saying you can't use these things because I know in some barns and areas, it's something you wanna use. Um, but if you build a little cage for it so that the insects can access the fly paper, but the bats and the birds can't, uh, it's an easy fix for when you're, you're using this kind of product. Um, chimneys that have smooth pipes or, or even uh, tall buckets with smooth sides, if a bat falls into these things, they can't get out because they can't fly. Uh, they can't climb up and they can't get enough lift from when they're stuck in a small space. So they can't actually get out. Uh, yeah, so you have to be careful with chimneys and things to make sure you screen the tops so that things can't get in, fly into it. And if you have a bucket, you're storing buckets or something in your barn, uh, either just turn them upside down or leave a, a, a log or, or like a stick or a, a piece of wood in it. So that if something falls into the bucket, they can just climb out. It's an easy fix. Same thing with rain barrels. Just make put something along the edges on the inside so that something can get out if it falls in. Burdock, I didn't realize this was such a big deal, but there, we've had a few instances of this reported where bats and birds, they can get stuck on the burrs of burdock. And burdock is an invasive species. It's not native to Alberta, so it's a good idea to pull it if you have it. Um, lighting can affect bats at night. There's a few species that like to hunt around lights if they have lots of insects, but then there's other species that hate light. And a, a line of street lights like this is enough to basically, it's like putting up a wall. They won't cross an area that's lit like this. They, it basically fragment, fragments their habitats. So controlling lighting in your area is also important. Cats, um, cats can hear bats, cats can smell bats. And if there's a, a roost around, kitty is outside at night, they definitely will be hunting bats. So you have to be uh, take care. If you've got a, a bat house or a roost nearby is just keep your cat in at night. And um, the other big one is white nose syndrome, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a minute. And uh, the, the wind turbines are uh, have a big impact on our migratory species in Alberta. And I, I touched on that already. So white nose syndrome is not in Alberta yet. Uh, we did some research this past year, part of our monitoring program, looking at uh, bat guano under bridges. And we were testing the guano for the fungus that causes white nose syndrome. And we did detect it in Saskatchewan. It, uh, we've got some hits in Valmarie, Saskatchewan, which is getting awfully close to Alberta. And uh, the, the samples are connected by a uh, river valley that leads right into Alberta. So I just, we could have it in Southeastern Alberta. We didn't have that many samples from Southeastern Alberta. So it, it could be here, but all the samples that we had tested didn't come back, they came back negative. So we don't think it's actually here yet. The fungus itself is an invasive fungus. Um, it, it was introduced in, uh, to, in the mid 2000s uh, from Europe. We think it came over on somebody's muddy boots, maybe. Uh, we're not exactly sure how it got to North America, but it started um, uh, in Upper New York State. They found these bats with the fungus growing around their noses and on their wings, and the fungus itself doesn't kill them. Um, here's just a big pile of dead bats in a hibernation site. It affects the bats while they're hibernating, because when they're, when they're in hibernation, they, their immune system isn't uh, boosted up so they're they're not fighting off infections um, but it wake the fungus itself it, it wakes them up so when a bat is hibernating it's relying on its fat reserves to make it through the winter and um, if it's woken up too many times it uses a ball of fat and they basically starve to death and that's what's causing the high rates of mortality and for little browns and northern myotis uh, the rates of overwinter mortality are 90 to 95 percent uh, we're actually concerned with, with the northern myotis. Their ra rates of mortality in east were up to 98%. So we we're worried about extinction for that species. And that's the one that's up in the boreal and that lives in the trees. So we don't really have a good 
grasp of numbers and we don't know where our bats hibernate in Alberta. We only have like two or three spots where we know where there's bats hibernating. There's obviously bats hibernating in many different locations, but we do not know where they are hibernating. And it's a big data gap that we have. So this is just a map. Um, you can look at whitenosesyndrome.org if you want more information on white nose syndrome. This is where it originated uh, since 2006. And it's just been progressing about a couple hundred kilometers every year, every spring we get new records. Um, and, and then we, we have some records now in, um, in Saskatchewan. I didn't update this one actually. There's, there's a couple of spots up here and a couple of spots right here. And you can see this is where they were in Montana last spring. And then this summer we confirmed it right where my pointer is. Um, that's all I'm going to say about that right now, but we've, it's over 10 million bats have died. It's considered the worst wildlife disease epidemic that has ever hit North America. Um, and we are concerned about our bat numbers, but the positive take home on this one is that in the East, the little brown myotis populations have been reduced by about 90% or more, uh, but they're stabilizing. So the ones that they have been finding, they seem to be they seem to have hit 10% and they're not going any lower. So uh, maybe over time we'll get recovery. But like I said at the very beginning, the recovery rate, it's really slow. So it's going to take many, many years before we get our bad populations back. Oh yeah, this is the updated, this is the Saskatchewan records that we found this past summer. And that was through efforts of the program in our Bats and Bridges project. So the probiotic solution is that we, we, we um, actually swabbed a bunch of bats and got healthy, naturally occurring fung fungal species that occur on healthy bats. And some of the native fungal species and bacteria that naturally occur on bat wings will outcompete and kill the invasive fungus. So it's like a probiotic kind of thing. So they, what they've done is they've cultured those species in the lab, the good ones, and they created a powder and introduced it to uh, nursery roosts late in the summer to give those bats uh, a good boost so that they, they have the good fungi and the good bacteria on their wings. And then the idea is that they go into hibernation, sort of uh, boost it up so that they can fight any white nose syndrome fungus if they encounter it. Um, this research is still ongoing. Uh, the results are really promising. So we'll, we'll know after this winter a bet, we'll have a better idea of just how effective it is. Most of that research is going on in the lower mainland of British Columbia. And that's through uh, our primary bat person, Corey Lawson, um, who works with, with WCS Canada. So quickly through bat houses, I'm, I'm running out of time, I think, uh, but we'll roll through this because I know people have questions about bat houses. Um, the biggest thing is to look for design. There's many different kinds of bat houses out there. This four chamber bat house is one that we have free plans on our website. They're pretty easy to build. Uh, they definitely, they have four chambers and that's of advantage. We also have rocket box design on our website. We haven't found this as being really effective. Not that many bats seem to be using it, but we don't, I don't know if that's because we don't have as many rocket boxes out there. There's more of these. Um, in the East, bats seem to like these. Um, but they, I don't know whether they just on a pole, maybe it's too windy and blow, blows around too much in Alberta, um, but they definitely seem to like this one better. And it's best to put them on a building. But uh, I talked to a pest control operator friend and he said to, it's okay to put it on a building, but maybe don't put it on your house because then you've got bats who might be looking at your house as a place to, to uh, occupy as well. So they can fit in. If you can fit your pinky finger into a gap, a bat can fit through it. So um, if you have an outbuilding, like a shed or a garage, that's a good place to put a bat house on, on some kind of a wall because they tend to do better on walls. A uh, bat condo is for when you have a really large colony of a thousand or more, um, and then you need a really big bat house. Uh, but stay away from the single chamber bat houses, they get too hot. Um, so if you look up inside of these bat houses, they have these little gaps, their little cavities, the chambers. They tend to be uh, three quarters of an inch or an inch wide. Um, and that gap spacing is specific for bats. That's what they like. Uh, this is a condo and it basically has a whole bunch of uh, baffles of these in place. So there's multiple sites for bats to, hire, uh, to roost in. This is just quickly some data. Um, like I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna go quick over some of the biggest things. Well, you can see this is a south-facing single chamber bat house. 
uh, the percent of the days that went over 40 degrees Celsius was 73%. So a south facing bat houses can get really, really hot and a single chain bat house, bats have nowhere to go. So we have had problems with bats overheating in bat houses if they're not in the right location or the wrong design and you can have heat death. So you want to not do this. Um, the four chamber bat houses facing east, um, the inner chambers are cooler than the outside chambers, right? The one that's right at facing the sun. Um, so they tend to get a little warm, but that's okay. Bats do like a hot roost. Um, but if it gets too hot, they can always go to the back chamber. So that's really important. Um, and, and buildings just offer lots of um, variability inside of a, a, a barn or something where they can move around and find the, the best spot to roost. And bats that roost in buildings don't always roost in the exact same spot. They, they often will move around, especially with changing weather. So recommendations, make sure you check your design. Don't use uh, material that's been treated. Uh, make sure it's rain tight. They like it dry. They like it hot. So you're targeting sort of 35 degrees Celsius uh, to 38. Um, but anything over 30 is kind of good. Like they want a nice warm spot, but not over 40. So you get it's spiking over 40, they can handle a bit of that, but if it gets too hot, you'll end up with dead pups underneath it. Um, it has to be three meters high and that's because they drop out of the bottom of the box to take flight and you don't want them getting, uh, you want them to have enough space to take off, but you also want them to be able to clear any kitty cats that are might be sitting underneath the where you've got the bat house so that they the cat can't jump as high as to get the bat as it flies out of the bottom of the box. So that's part of the, it's that clear flight path that you have to consider underneath your bat box. Um, insulation, try to find a spot that's out of the wind. East facing seems to be good. On a building seems to be good. Uh, you can attach, look up something called a French cleat. That seems to be the easiest way to attach these bat boxes. Some of them are kind of heavy. Um, you can also use an oversized backboard so that you could just um, screw it into the, the back, of, into the wall, if that's what you're going to do. And again, three meters high. So you get a design, design fails is when you, you, you don't, if you use um, nails that pop instead of wood screws uh, or single chambers can be bad. Try to avoid putting screen inside because the screen can detach over time. It, it will um, trap guano, can trap bats, it can be a problem. Um, there's, this is all covered in our Building Better Bat Houses uh, guidebook as well. So um, make sure you use a really good design uh, and not in a shady spot. So this is on a tree. So you can put them on trees in some cases. This is actually from Bowness Park, um, but this is a big tree and there's no branches shading it. So you have to be very wary if you've got shading happening. They won't like it if it's shady, it's too cold. So you have bats in buildings. Uh, remember, you can keep a bat, a bat colony in a building. If you can, I always say, if you can manage for the poop, then you can keep a bat, bat colony in the building. Um, if you can't manage the bat poop, you can't get access to clean it out every year or every other year, uh, you don't want bats in your building because the, boop, the poop will accumulate over time. But the good thing is that they don't bring in nesting material. They just roost on, on like this. This is all they do. They don't bring in any materials. They don't chew. They don't chew wires. They don't chew uh, the building itself. Um, so you can host a bat colony in a building. It just takes a little bit more care. And if you look at our Bats in Buildings guidebook, it does talk about keeping bats in buildings. And it also talks about, with the other guidebook talks about if you want to exclude them. Um, and we always offer this and and we tell people this because sometimes you get a building that you can't seal up. So you have no way to actually keep the bats out. If it's a really old building, um, the number of crevices and cracks that can appear every year can increase uh, with wind and, and freezing and thawing. Um, the wood expands and it forms a new crack and then the bats can access it. So, but you can live with bats in your building. You just have to take care and clean up after them. Um, a sure sign that you've got bats is if you have bat poop, uh, bat guano, you can tell from mouse guano if you crush it, 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 it crushes into a fine powder, a rough powder, uh, and that's the bits of insect exoskeleton that they couldn't digest. Um, make sure you wash your hands afterwards. If you have mouse poop, you really want to wash your hands, um, and there are some precautions you want to take if, if you have, if you're in a dusty old building, 
um, because you want to avoid mouse poop. There's really no risk from bat poop, um, but mouse poop can be a problem. And we also have protocols for collecting guano. If you want to send us a sample, we're always happy to get bat poop. I know we're crazy, um, but we want it in a paper envelope and make just make sure you have all the date and location name and, and contact information. Um, but that's all on our website. So rabies and bats, only less than half a percent of the free flying population will actually contract rabies. They can contract rabies, they're mammals. All mammalian wildlife should be considered uh, a, a risk. You should never be contacting barehandedly any wild mammals. Uh, we're mammals, so we can get rabies too. Uh, but bats get rabies, they usually die from it and quickly. It, they usually only last a week or two. Uh, they don't really, they don't carry the disease. Um, but any bare skin contact that you have with a bat does warrant uh, immediate trip to a health professional, and you may end up with your uh, post-exposure rabies series. Uh, not a biggie; it's like four shots in the arm, uh, and it's a good it's a good series to have if we ever get to travel again, because there's lots of places in the world where rabies is endemic in dogs that are running the streets and stuff. So, um, but as long as you don't touch bats. There's no risk. You have to actually contact them. It's rabies is transferred via saliva. So you basically you have to be get you have to have a bite and you have to have bare skin contact to be at risk. So no touch, no risk. Uh, when do you report a bat? If you find injured bats, cat attack bats, bird attack bats, or if it's like past, I'd say um, the end of September, then you should contact uh, wildlife rehabbers. And if you look at our website, we have what to do if you found a bat. Found a bat, just click on that icon and it gives you the list of all the wildlife rehabbers across Alberta that take bats. And they will, uh, the ones that we have listed, will rehabilitate bats. So thanks. I hope I didn't go too late. I think I went a little bit over. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. And, um, and these are all of our, our sponsors that help support our program through grants. Um, we're especially uh, thankful for the Calgary Foundation and Edmonton Foundation and the Alberta Conservation Association and Alberta EcoTrust. These are our primary ones that have helped the program. So thank you. Well, that's great. Thanks, Susan. I um, didn't think I could be more of a bat forget than I was, but uh, <laughs> apparently I could. So thanks for all that information. I think um, everyone will, will agree that it was fascinating and hopefully everyone learned something. Um, the chat's been pretty active too with some good, um, oh, good. Uh, with some, some good chatter. So I encourage people to take a look there if you haven't. We will, there's a couple of questions, so we'll ask those um, uh, at the end. I'm just going to give a little presentation hear about Alice and how that works as soon as I figure out how to screen share. All right, there we go. That's, that's looking better. Um, so yeah, feel, feel free to throw your chat, your comments in the chat and your questions in the chat in the meantime. And um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the ALICE program and how our program kind of fits in with helping bats and supporting bat habitats. So, um, so ALICE is a program that we can think about being where agriculture and nature meet. Um, so we're all about looking at the agricultural landscape and helping producers understand areas of their farm that are maybe marginal for agricultural production, but that can be used to produce other very important ecosystem services on behalf of society. So things like cleaner water, biodiversity, um, wildlife habitat, in this case, bad habitat, um, and all sorts of goodies. So our mission is to help farmers and ranchers specifically to develop and build these nature-based solutions on their landscapes so that they can sustain both their agricultural operation and biodiversity um, for the benefit of the greater community as well as future generations. And we're actually really interested in the whole suite of ecosystem services that farms have to offer. So we want to look at things like water filtration and recharge. So that, um, that includes 
flood and drought mitigation. We're interested in um, cleaner air and just sort of cleaner habitats. Um, carbon capture, carbon sequestration, um, certainly a buzzword these days, but also a very important um, piece of the work that we do. Um, we also do a lot of work that helps to build soil health and soil quality and develop the nutrient cycles um, happening on the landscape. And we also support projects that um, provide native habitat um, or, or suitable habitat for a number of species, um, pollinators, wildlife, and again, in this case, we're looking specifically at some of the examples um, of ways we can support that habitat. So Alice itself is a market-driven program. I personally like to describe it as the farmer's market for ecosystem services. So we're all really familiar with, you know, if, you, if you're a farmer, you take your, your crop um, or your livestock to a market. I'm a hungry person. I come and say, hey, here, here's my cash. Uh, you know, give me my, my beef or my corn or whatever it is I'm looking for. Um, what really wasn't available in the past um, to any large degree anyways, was a mechanism for farmers and ranchers to be able to value the other work that they're doing on their farms. So things like providing um, flood mitigation um, or carbon sequestration. And so that's what Alice is helping to build. We're kind of that, um, that hub that um, brings together the farmers that have the product to produce in the ecosystem services and the public who are interested in actually receiving those services. So that might be governments, might be corporations, might be individuals, um, foundations, etc. So really what we're saying is that those ecosystem services that are produced by Alice projects have a real value, um, real economic value in that marketplace. And so Alice is actively working to develop that market. Um, so we do this through a, a payment structure. So when we work with farmers and ranchers, we actually engage them as on-site managers. And it's, what, it's one of the reasons that Alice works so well is you have this population of people, farmers and ranchers, who are really good at producing things out of nature. It's what they do all day, every day. Meanwhile, they also have large tracts of land. Um, some of the largest land holdings in Canada. And so it, it creates this perfect um, microcosm where we're actually able to produce ecosystem services at scale and quite efficiently and effectively. So Alice engages these on-site land managers um, to, to manage and maintain the projects that get put in the ground. So we do this through two ways. Um, one is we'll cost share with the producer to get that project actually established. Um, by cost sharing, the producer also has some skin in the game. They wanna make sure that their project is successful. Um, and, and the reality is that most, most Alice projects have great public benefit and they also have benefit to the farmer ranch. So it makes sense that we kind of share that. Um, and then Alice engages them um, to make sure that that project is maintained in the long term. So we actually pay them annually um, to do that management. Alice uses, um, it, it's quite, it's a very, very flexible program. We ask all of the communities who deliver our program to, to follow a few simple um, sort of principles. Um, and, and the key to the Alice program is that it is a community developed program. So communities on the ground are really developing their own program, prioritizing, um, you know, what makes sense for them and their communities, um, you know, what's, what's kind of at the biggest stake environmentally. Um, in their local area, um, what, um, what's, what's going to work for them. And it's a farmer delivered program. So the farmer or rancher is really in the driver's seat um, providing those solutions. And it's a voluntary program. So um, we're not like a, um, an easement program or anything like that. We don't go on title. Nobody's really beholden to it. Um, the program actually works so well because it is flexible. So we do sign um, conservation agreements with the producer, usually five years in length. Um, and typically we review those, those um, contracts at the end of that term as well. Um, but there's, there's um, quite a bit of flexibility. So it's, that's all built in. 
And Alice works on a, a huge number of different kinds of projects, um, some of which are very helpful to bats. Um, and I would argue that actually probably the majority are, are supporting bats um, directly or indirectly. So we do lots of things. Um, we we can specifically look at um, trying to create habitat or fix a, a problem like um, you know bank erosion or something like that. We do a lot of work, especially here in Alberta, on wetlands and riparian habitats and um, making sure that those water sources are available and clean and that the um, that that important um, riparian area, which is the area affected by water, um, that has higher biodiversity is is intact and functional. Um, we can also create habitat, whether that's through tree planting or other sort of um, micro needs of, of different species. Um, and then we also help producers to do things that may help them manage their livestock as well. Um, so often connected with things like riparian areas um, will help them with management fencing. So uh, like I said, in Alberta, a lot of our projects are wetland based, um, particularly with our ranching community. So we'll do a lot of protection and enhancement of, of riparian areas. So um, looking at ways that we can get this whole ecosystem functioning um, optimally so that there is flood and drought control, um, habitat, carbon sequestration, all of those pieces. Uh, we also look at a lot of the sort of landscape scale issues. So again, looking at, at kind of the the bigger picture of um, flood and drought conditions across the community, um, looking at things like um, habitat connectivity and as Susan was saying, sort of making sure that those those fragmented pieces have some kind of, of a contiguous um, path for for wildlife um, such as bats to move around in. Um, and then we've had a couple of projects that have been a little bit more specific to bats. So this this is um, our group of Alice coordinators. Um, a few years ago, we made bat houses as part of our um, our sort of like yearly education series and conference. And uh, so a lot of these bat, bat houses have now been installed on um, Alice project sites. And um, yeah, that's very exciting. And then I just want to show a quick video here um, that is probably um, one of the most bat specific projects that, it, that Alice has engaged in. Um, so it was a collective effort. The Alberta Community Bat Program um, was involved with it. Um, it was put on by um, Alice Vermilion River. So that was the county of Vermilion River. Um, and then the students and faculty of Lakeland College and um, some other partners as well. So I'm just going to let them speak for themselves. So with the bat restoration project that we did with, uh, during our habitat conservation class, um, there was a landowner who previously had a very large colony of bats on his property that uh, roosted within the sides of the old farmhouse. He had, used to have this colony there and would like to try and do some restoration work to try and encourage those bats to return. So with our instructor Darcy Sheary, they talked to him and he brought that forward to those students. I'm a representative for the Alberta Community Bat Program as well as an instructor at Lakeland College. Little brown bats have recently been listed as an endangered species in Canada and elsewhere uh, because of population declines uh, from a disease. This is called white nose syndrome and is actually killing millions, millions of bats in eastern Canada and the eastern United States. So with the bat project, we do a lot of outreach and try to educate people on how important the bats are for communities, especially for agriculture, for how much they reduce the uh, overall bat populations. So we do uh, bat house building for people to put up either on a property or we've donated some to Alberta Environment and Parks to put up within one of the provincial parks. And that helps avoid the spread of disease because it, it prevents the bats from colonizing in very large colonies and they're more isolated colonies. Uh, we bring students out for events like this at Lakeland College because that's part of the way we teach. We get the students outside of the classroom getting hands-on experience 
with real projects. We couldn't do this on our own without our partners that do assist us in these sort of activities. So for this uh, bat restoration, uh, we've got Alice, the County of Vermilion River, the Alberta Community Bat Program, Lakeland College, and we've even got industrial support from Husky, who is providing some funds. People with that kind of experience coming from these more technical schools, um, they're a lot more employable. Uh, it also helps us connect with people outside of the school, which might help us in our future careers. So this is a, a wonderful activity that brings students in, out in the field, getting real-world experience doing wildlife conservation, and it's also bringing a bunch of partners together for what is a really great project. All right. Um, I think my screen share has fallen off, so sorry. Two seconds. All right, try that again. All right, so that was a really uh, interesting uh, project and, and very, very specific to bats. We've seen a couple other similar kinds of project um, proposals as well, um, some of them targeting bats and, and some even other species like turkey vultures, which is pretty neat. So Alice um, has a fairly big reach now. Uh, as of the end of March, we had over 32,000 acres of land enrolled in Alice. And um, we're in six provinces, 31 communities across Canada, and over 1,100 farmers and ranchers engaged. So um, we've gotten to be quite a large program. Um, here in Alberta, we are in 17 communities currently. You can kind of see a map um, on the left there where we're at. If you're coming in to us uh, from outside of, uh, of Alberta, we were also, as I said, in, in six provinces. So you can check us out there. And I would encourage you to go to alice.ca to find your local program and they can fill you in more on what options might be available to you and um, you can talk about any project ideas that you have with your local coordinator. So um, with that, let's turn it over to some questions. Um, so Susan, I'll maybe just start you off with a question that we had earlier in the chat and then I'll just check to see um, what's come in while I was talking there. So Jay had asked earlier, um, did the dry conditions this past summer have an impact on food availability for bats? Uh, well, we, nobody was really monitoring that. So I don't know if we would, I can actually answer that. Um, I it Possibly. Uh, it, it could have gone either way. I mean, there could have been insects that hatched out earlier. Um, like it affects, usually temperature will affect timing of hatches of insects. Um, it, if we, if you had areas that where ponds dried up completely, uh, you might have be missing aquatic insects in an area where they normally depend on them. So yeah, it could have affected them that way. Um, but then you might've had other species of insects that hatched out that have been waiting to hatch out. Like there's, different types of bugs that just wait for those kinds of conditions, right? So uh, yeah, hard to say, hard to say. Yeah, it, it, but climate change is definitely, it can affect bat, bats are, I, I'm not, they're very flexible and responsive to temperature because of they'll go into hibernation early if it's cold early or they'll stay awake later if it's warm later. But then it's, it's a how does, how, how do those temperatures affect their food source is a, is a great question. And, and that's the part that will ultimately affect our bat populations as well. Yeah. So good, so good, yeah, good questions. Um, all right, so uh, John Saremba, I may have butchered your name there, sorry. Um, yeah, I know John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was say, you must, he seems very knowledgeable on bats. He had lots of great comments throughout the chat. Um, yeah. But one, one question that sort of came up is um, whether there's any bat urine collection happening um, to monitor for neonicotinoids. Yeah, no, that's interesting because I hadn't heard that they were collecting urine. We we actually have a uh, had a pilot project going this summer. Um, so along with the bat guano I was collecting at farms, I was getting some fresh bat guano uh, and freezing it in a preservative as in a preservative, and then freezing it for 
Environment Canada, and we're working with um, a person out of Edmonton in Ottawa, and they're doing a neonicotinoid study as well. So they're looking for neonics in, in guano, uh, but I hadn't heard that they were looking at anyone looking at it in urine. So, oh my God, maybe that's next year. Maybe next summer I'm going to be collecting bat pee. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, he had said it in context um, that yeah. there's somebody looking at hummingbird urine for Yeah. For so no, it's really interesting. And, and that it's interesting because, yeah, um, that we know that neonicotinoids can affect bats. It can affect their, uh, for young bats, uh, it, it affects their flight development and echolocation. Um, so we know there's actually some toxicity there, uh, but uh, we don't know if they're, if they're actually exposed from uh, any of the neonics that are used on the crops in Alberta. We, we have no idea if it's moving up the food chain to them or not. So that's, that was this is the first step in trying to figure that out. Mm. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, Bruce Kazuyi, so I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names. <laughs> I'll probably butcher them all. Um, is wondering, has any sun shields uh, been used on accessible bat houses during heat dome conditions? Yeah, actually, there was um, a, a colony that I collected back on at, and and the the homeowners put up a, a heat shield, and they their bats stayed. Um, and then there was a few other places where we actually had temperature monitors in the, in British Columbia. There's a student who's just finishing up her master's that has been looking at temperature conditions in bat houses. And she had some uh, with heat shields. Uh, and they, it was, it makes a difference of a couple of degrees, actually. It's, so it's significant enough that it, the bats can still be quite hot and they'll still be sometimes at the bottom of the box. Like if they get overheated, they'll, what they call bulge. And they'll come at the bottom and you'll see them all hanging at the bottom. Um, but a couple of degrees cooler is enough that you don't get uh, mortality. So, yeah, it can be significant, actually. So okay. it, there's different ways people have done that. They had there was one guy in the Okanagan who had a, a roll down screen, like a, a window screen that he, he, he put up outside of his on the side of his the wall where he had the bat house and he had a long pole and he would just pull it down when the bats needed the shade and then he would put it back up when it was cooler so that they could get warm so yeah there's people are being in very uh uh you know innovative and in figuring out ways to to cool bat houses interesting no one's installing little mini air conditioners though no no mini air conditioners yet not that i've heard <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so our, this next question I think may um, may have a little bit of a multi-pronged answer and we're just getting to the end of our formal time. So I'm just going to um, say if you have to go, we really appreciate you joining us for the webinar and, and thank you, Susan, for sharing all of your um, expertise. It's been amazing and I think we've learned so much. Just lots of thank you comments in the chat there um but if if you're okay to stay on for a few more minutes susan i'd like to maybe just keep the questions going and um, those of you who are able to stay please please do yeah okay um so yeah I, next question is um ron asks he's had a four chamber bat house up for a number of years and it's never been occupied is there some way to attract the bats Mm. So beware, there are people out there that will tell you that you can uh, make a tea out of bat poop and paint it on the inside of the, of the bat house. That really, they have, there's no research that, that supports that. And there, I've seen people that have products where they have the spray, they say it's a pheromone for bats that will attract bats, but no, that doesn't work either. They're just taking your money. You, the, the key part is to have a good location and have a good bat house design. Um, and make sure you just offer the right kinds of temperatures. And then you have to have patience. It can take uh, some of the work that uh, Robert Barkley did out of the UFC. It, it can take any, anywhere up to five years before they find it. Um, but bats, like our, the tree roosting bats, use a lot of different roosts naturally. Like uh, the, the colonies will often have like three primary trees and they can use up to 25 other alternate roosts where the colonies will move in parts sometimes where two or three bats are here and two or three bats here. Um, and I think they're just checking out alternate roosts all the time. So you have to get one of those explorer bats to explore and find your bat house. And I always say you can, if you put um, something below your bat house, like a piece of cardboard or a plastic and check that uh, like at the very, like on the ground, you might find like one or two pieces of bat guano and it might be your scout. So you might have been scouted, but you don't have a colony yet. So that can give you an idea of if they found you yet. 
Um, and it might be at some point that they, they all move in, but they do, they, the colonies can move around quite a bit too. Interesting. That's great. Yeah. And I think the location, like you mentioned, is, is really important too. Um, just recognizing your habitat um, availability around you. Like, I mean, I have a bathhouse um, up at my house, but I live in the city near Fish Creek Park. There's much better habitat down the street um, than there is in my backyard. I don't really have a pond or anything like that. So, but, but you'd be surprised. I had a bat detector in my backyard and I'm in the Northwest in a very urban neighborhood. And I was getting about 20 bat passes a night at which is, I, I never have seen bats in my neighborhood. And I was like, what? There's somebody flying by 20 times a night yeah. <laughs> and a couple different species. So I think they're there. It's just a matter of them finding you, I think. Yeah. And, and what are the little um, like echolocation um, sound meters for your phone called? Uh, it's called an echo meter touch. And it's um, wildlife acoustics. I have one right here. And yeah, they're just little tiny devices and they, and you can get, I don't know if they have the Mac ones anymore, but they, they had them for Android and Macs and you could plug them into your, your iPhone or your, your phone. Yeah. It's very handy. It's, a, it's a really nice piece of equipment actually. So if you're a little bit nerdy um, like me, that might be something to add to your yeah. account list <laughs> for the year. Um, okay, um, I think there was one other question that's actually not directed to us, but um, John, if you're still on the calls, um, not to put you on the spot here, but there was a question um, for you whether you do, whether BMN does webinars. I think um, he, I don't know if he's there. I think I saw him, he left the chat. Okay. Um, do you know the answer? <laughs> yeah, so he's, he's with the Burke Mountain Naturalists group um, out of Port Coquitlam, I think. Um, and if he does do any webinars, uh, you can keep an eye on Alberta Bats. I'll, I'll be sure to post it because we communicate. So we try to work cooperatively with the other provinces, especially British Columbia. Um, so we keep our uh, best practices consistent and uh, it, because they are, they should be the same. Um, and we work together to try not to duplicate work as well. Right. So, yeah. All right, so I think um, that I have snagged all the actual questions in the chat, but if you have anything else, um, feel free to get it in there or just unmute and, and ask, or if I've missed one of your questions, um, just unmute yourself and say, hey, hey, it's me. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, you mentioned off the top about uh, native plants um to support bat populations w would that just be um you know the typical to bring in more insects it, it, i mean is that the point of that or can you give me a bit more detail well th there, i actually uh put a species list in that uh bat friendly communities guidebook so there's oh awesome i just called in so i'll i'll look at the uh what the presentation afterwards so i'm i'm on my phone i didn't see it but i i'm yeah, yeah. really interested to look at that well, I'd, I'd like to have a more refined list because obviously you want to pick plants that um, moth, that are hosts for moth species and things like that. So some of the things right. that they do recommend are like late flowering plants that bloom like at dusk because those ones attract moth pollinators. So then, oh, you, nice. okay. right? So then you could have bats coming in to eat the moths in your backyard. But um, yeah, but any right. The, right. The native plants are the native material that the insects are going to feed off of and, and, and lay eggs and breed on. So that's what you want to have in your backyard. So I was always Very trying nice. to help people, yeah. Diversify, get away from grass, diversify. Yeah, your for backyard. sure. We're moving out of the city to, uh, to an acreage that has some, uh, some pasture for holistic grazing and quite a bit of natural forest. So I'm, I'm really interested in, uh, in checking out the details you've offered and seeing what else we can do to, to, to uh, attract them and support them. Great, yeah. And, and I'll and also check out what's available in the county already, what's already being done, because I'd love to get involved. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, um, and if you do put up a bat house, like you said, we have a citizen science project and we're relying on Albertans to register their bat houses and then count their bats. So if you get bats in a roost somewhere, just we'd love to hear about right it. Right on. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. And um, sorry. What, just one more thing. The um, uh, the Android Apple 
uh, was it an app that you mentioned? The Echo, I, I jotted it down. I don't recall yeah. the name. So the, the unit that you plug into your phone or your tablet is called an Echo Meter Touch. And there's, I think it's the uh -huh. Echo Meter Touch 2. There's a pro version, but it's more expensive. You can just get the basic one. Oh, that's cool. okay. <laughs> and it's about $170. But the, um, when you buy the thing, then you download from whatever store, web store, um, the free application. Uh, and I think it's, it's uh, I always forget the name of it. Well, it's not Kaleidoscope. It's, um, I don't know, there's any, they tell you, but it, it, there's a there's a free application you can download to your, your phone. And then that's what you use right. to talk to the thing. So I use it's it on- It's entertaining, I, I bet. Yeah, I do bat talks or bat walks in the summer sometimes. And I have a set of um, tablets with these things attached. And yeah, that's what people use. And so they can identify what bats are flying over their head. That's very fun. I bet it is. That sounds great. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, you're totally welcome. Thanks everybody for, for all the good questions. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, and Kendra put a uh, link to that um, accusing yeah. me the echo meter touch in there in the chat so thanks for that um vivian asked is there a saskatchewan bat organization well funny you should ask so they just they're just initiating one um i'm actually uh working with them as well so we're like i said we try to be cooperative um but they're they're creating their own little sask bat group uh but they haven't got a community bat program yet so yeah, the, the British Columbia started it. They have a community bat program. Um, and then we initiated one and we're kind of the, the two Western provinces that are sort of furthest ahead with the with that uh, approach, which I think is a good one because it involves people and, and people and the farming community, especially like you said, they have the big land base. And they have the biggest impact on bat populations and bat, bat habitats. So, yeah. Good questions. Yeah, ex excellent questions and lots of engagement. So thank you all for that. Um, if, unless there's anything else, I think we can probably wrap it up and um, um, take wing. <laughs> take wing. <laughs> out no. the it's time uh, to go hibernate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time to, time to drop into torpor. <laughs> you, you get fat, you get a little fatter over Christmas. And then, yeah, hybrid for the rest of the winter. That's the strategy. I'm down for it. I could, I could be a bad impact <laughs> life for sure. All right. Well, with that, I wish everybody a happy holidays, and um, thank you very much for participating. Yes. Well, thank you for inviting us. It's always good to be out and talk to the Alice crew. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Susan.